Funding for Amish cooking from quilt country with Marsha Adams was provided by... Sauter Woodworking, America's furniture craftsman. And by Marilat Industries, America's cabinet maker, committed to quality and a variety of kitchen and bath cabinetry styles. Hello, I'm Marsha Adams, and welcome to Amish Cooking from Quilt Country. Before we begin our first recipe today, I'd like to give you a historical background about the dish's origin. When the first German, Amish, and Mennonites arrived in Pennsylvania, they found themselves neighbors to Quakers and other English-speaking farmers who had come there from Western England and Wales. Those people have a dairy-based culture, which in the cooking world is also called white gravy cookery. And the Amish and Mennonites adapted to that cooking style. It uses butter and milk, thickened with flour in a vast number of sauces and gravy combinations. This would include things like chicken gravy or sausage gravy and even white sauce. However, today, we're going to emphasize mostly on desserts, using milk as a major ingredient. Many people think of ice cream as being the quintessence of American food, but I want to tell you the recipe is at least a century older than America is. It probably began as a way of preserving milk, but pleasure soon became the dominant motive in making it. It's really easy to do. I hope you'll try it. Here in the mixer bowl, I have three egg yolks, and they've been beaten up. And to that, I'm going to add a half a cup of sugar, and a tablespoon of very good vanilla, and one cup of half and half, and two cups of whipping cream. And then you beat that thoroughly for three minutes. And I'm going to tell you a little secret. The secret of a good homemade ice cream is to make the ingredients the day before, just like I did here, and chill it overnight in the refrigerator. By chilling the mixture that long in advance, your ice cream has more volume. This ice cream then will be finished at the end of the show and we're going to be able to eat it. And here is this recipe that we mixed up yesterday and we're going to pour it in to this beater. I called it a beater, but really it is an ice cream maker. I love it. I love it because it isn't any work to make ice cream. Um, this whole machine goes in your freezer for at least 24 hours. And if you can put it in for 48 hours, that's even better. And as you can see, this is a lot easier than packing uh, an old-fashioned freezer with ice because this recipe was originally made for an old-fashioned freezer packed with ice. And we still make it that way at our house and especially on the 4th of July. And that's one of my husband's favorite recipes. In fact, our friends request that he make them homemade ice cream. Now, there. Now, the only thing you have to do with these little freezers is to turn this two or three times during a 20-year period. I love the old-fashioned freezers. Nostalgic and fun. But admittedly, these are a lot, lot easier. And we're just going to put it over here. My next recipe, rice pudding, is probably out of the uh, English tradition, for it was once served at many Sunday dinners all over Great Britain. And I'm just going to use the same mixer, and anything to save a dish. You girls all know about that, and you fellow cooks too. And it was considered a very luxurious food for many centuries. And during the Middle Age, it was often served at wedding banquets. And we begin making this wonderful rice pudding with two cups of scalded milk and one third cup of long grain rice. And you cook these together for 20 minutes. And we're going to transfer this to this buttered casserole. See this? You can see that the rice is nicely cooked. Now actually, you could make this with skimmed milk and an egg substitute and a sugar substitute and you still have a, quite a tolerable dish. And then to that, we're going to add a half a cup of currants. Now you could use yellow raisins or you could use dark raisins. Isn't this pretty? Now I'm going to make the more custard sauce to pour over the top. 
Here we have three eggs, and they've been well beaten. And to that, we're going to add two cups of half and half. We're really living it up today, as you can see. And a half a cup of sugar. And a liberal two teaspoons of vanilla. And then just a speck of salt. Heat it up quickly. See how easy this is? And then pour that over the top. Don't mix it in. Because when we finish it up, we're going to have a layered dessert that's really quite elegant. And then over the top, I am going to put cinnamon. Now you could use nutmeg, but we're going to use nutmeg on some other dishes today. So we're going to use cinnamon on this rice pudding. Be liberal. There, slather it on. Mmm, doesn't that look good? And then bake this at 350 degrees for one hour in a pan of hot water. And that ensures slow, even cooking and a lovely, delicate custard. As I mentioned, during the Middle Ages, rice was often served at weddings. And it also has associations with fertility. <laughs> and all of this comes together with our throwing rice at weddings. And you know what? Rice pudding was still being served at weddings in Pennsylvania as late as the 1900s. And the bride and groom had to share the first bite, just as we do wedding cakes today. So it's no wonder we find lots of rice puddings at Amish and Mennonite tables. I like to serve this rice pudding, and this is what it looks like when it's finished. Isn't this lovely? I like to serve this rice pudding with a lemon sauce over the top. Maybe you could even want it on the side. And you can see the layers there of the sauce. You find the recipe in the cookbook, which you can get at your local library. And I think I want to check this ice cream. It's thickening up all right. A wonderful little miracle. The next recipe is a very unorthodox cornbread. It has buttermilk among its ingredients. And you pour additional milk over the top of the batter just before you bake it. And you don't stir it in. Here in the bowl, uh, in the sifter rather, I have uh, one and a third cup of cornmeal, one third cup of flour, a fourth of a cup of sugar, and a teaspoon of baking powder, and a teaspoon and a half of salt. And we're going to sift this. This a sifting process not only mixes the ingredients, but adds air and helps it puff up. Cornmeal is made from dried corn, and I'm sure you'd figure that out. And in the north, yellow cornmeal is more common. You find white cornmeal in the south, and it's a very important ingredient in their delightful spoon bread. If you can get stone ground cornmeal, you will have a more enriched cornmeal with a germ left in it. Most of our uh, dried corn products and recipes originated with our Indians. They were really the first experts in corn cookery. Now, to this, we're going to add two whole eggs and beat them up with this pastry fork. This is a very good tool to have. It's ideal for making pastry as well as biscuits and stirring up coarse batters like this. And then we're going to add one cup of regular milk, mix it in. See, this is all done by hand. I want to talk to you a bit about sifters as I do this. You're going to have a sifter like I used for a long time in your life. And so plan on spending a generous amount on it. Don't get a cheap one because it, it won't do the job well. And I get mine at, baking at a baking supply store. They used to make what they called triple screened sifters, but I haven't seen one of those for years. Now we're going to add one cup of buttermilk. And stir that in. This is very runny, and that's precisely the way it's supposed to be. Now this is uh, one of the secrets of this recipe, and I'll show you what we're going to do. We have a preheated, very heavy skillet in a 400 oven, and so this is really a hot skillet, and it has two tablespoons of butter in it. And we're going to transfer this very runny batter right to the skillet. Make sure the skillet's hot and use a heavy one. And you can see what's already happening. The butter's kind of coming up to the top and it's beginning to cook already. That's important. And then over the top, we add another cup of milk. Just dribble it on. 
Don't stir it in though, because what happens at the end of this recipe is that that milk sort of floats on top. It makes a very lovely moist cornbread. And then we're going to sprinkle on lots of paprika for garnish. And then return this to the 400 oven and bake it for 30 to 35 minutes. And you have a most elegant cornbread. We would eat this at our house with chili, or we would even perhaps have it with ham and bean soup. There, isn't that good looking? Now we're going to cut this up in a wedge because that's the way you actually serve it. I love these old black spiders. This has been in my family for a long time and we use it for fried potatoes and uh, fried fish too, incidentally, and the Amish fried chicken in it. There it comes, there it comes. Mmm, yum. Now, look right here and you see the, the double layers of it. Isn't that pretty? And eat this while it's warm, slathered with a lot of fresh butter. It's the best cornbread you've ever had. I want to talk to you a little bit about milk itself. Raw milk is milk fresh from the dairy animal. It's untreated and unheated. Pasteurized milk has been heated to a temperature high enough to kill any harmful bacteria in it. Another important byproduct of milk, of course, is cheese. And the Amish are famous for their cheese, especially in the Swiss Amish communities. We visited an Amish cheese factory and also an Amish dairy. And I must tell you, this barn where we went to watch them doing the milking was a fascinating and informative experience. You can almost tell an Amish farm by the windmill on the property, which pumps the needed water for the family and the livestock. Every morning, long before the sun is up, the cows are milked the old-fashioned way, by hand. The whole family helps with this milking operation, including Tippy, the dog. The warm milk is carried to the attached and immaculate milk house, where it is poured through a strainer into these 10-gallon metal milk cans. The local cheese factory picks up the chilled milk from approximately 450 Amish farmers. This cheese factory has Amish cheesemakers who still make cheese much the way they have done for two centuries. Every farmer has a number, and his milk is weighed and checked for quality before being dumped into the stainless steel pasteurizer. The cans are washed before they're returned to the farmers. The pasteurizer heats the milk to 161 degrees. Then it is transferred to the large vats in the background. Each can handle 50,000 pounds of milk per hour. It takes milk from 2,000 dairy cows to fill one vat. Rennet and starter are added to the vat, and then the milk begins to thicken. The cream is skimmed off and is made into butter. The thickening curds and whey are pumped into draining tables. The whey is the white bubbly liquid on top. The whey is then drained off, and large automated rakes stir the curds to keep it broken up. Salt is added to the curds by hand to stop the cheese process. The curds are then transferred to Colby Longhorn presses, and there are 60 horns of cheese in each cart, or hoops as they're called. This would make a lot of grilled cheese sandwiches, not to mention macaroni and cheese. These cloth-lined steel tubular molds are topped with paper, then pressed for three and a half hours before they're wrapped. The young Amish women will only work here until they're married. After they marry, they assume the traditional role of homemaker and mother and will not work outside of the house again. However, they might make quilts and sell those or perhaps bake goods for extra pocket money. After removing the cheese from the hoop, the cheese is then packaged. Each horn of cheese weighs about 13 pounds. 
It is then packed in four horns per box and stored at 36 degrees until it is shipped out to the grocery stores. It has no synthetic ingredients and no chemical preservatives. Butter is made in long rolls like this, very old fashioned. And this is what the cheese curds look like. See them? They're very coarse. And people go to the cheese factory and buy this in bulk and they use it for recipes like macaroni and cheese. Uh, this is the Colby cheese, which is their specialty, and they call this Amish butter cheese, and it's very similar to our Munster cheese. As you know, this would be, all be very, very good eating. I think I better check the ice cream. Mmm, I can hardly wait. Another pie that I think the Amish do very well is custard pie. And a lot of people don't make custard pie because it has a reputation for being difficult. So I want to dispel some of those things that maybe have kept you from making it. Uh, we begin with, it's just a handful of ingredients. In fact, it's almost like the ingredients that go into the ice cream, which is one of the things that I find that the Amish do marvelously. They just keep taking these same old fashioned ingredients that they have on their farm and with, have endless variations a very good cooking by the way they put them together. So, first of all, we're going to need four eggs. And to that, we're going to add three-fourths cup of sugar and a fourth and one teaspoon, one and one-fourth teaspoon of vanilla and a speck of salt. And put that together. And to that, we're going to add two cups of scalded milk. Now, one reason that the milk is scalded is that it's going to partially cook the eggs the minute we add this warm milk to this mixture. And scalding means heating the milk until bubbles just form around the edge. And if you heat it just maybe even a few seconds longer, you'll get a skin on that milk, and you can see that skin. So this now is scalded milk. And you add this very quickly to the egg mixture. Now don't beat this too much because you don't want too many bubbles. I don't want to make you afraid of this pie. I think I've made it sound very difficult and it isn't a difficult pie. You just throw the stuff together and, and bake it. But one of the things that's very important on a custard pie is how you bake it in the oven. Because people say, well, I don't make custard pies because the bottom crust never gets done. It's always soggy. Well, let me tell you how to avoid that. You put this pie on the bottom shelf of your oven and on the very lowest shelf and it cooks much quicker. Now this is a nutmeg grinder and I really prefer the hand grated nutmeg because it has so much more flavor. If you notice, this is what whole nutmegs look like. Aren't they pretty? They're almost like brown beads. They last a number of years. So bake the, your pie then on the lowest shelf of the oven, 350 degrees for 40 minutes. This is a pleasing pie when it's all finished. A lovely thing, velvet custard pie. It turned out very nicely, and yours will too. Let's talk about the difference between condensed milk and regular milk. Condensed milk products are very useful because they supply milk fat and solids in a concentrated form, and they're treated to keep for several months on your shelf. It's, uh, condensed milk is made very rapidly, or I should say it's rapidly evaporated off about one-third of its water. But it's not heat done by heating. It's done by putting it under a vacuum. Sweetened condensed milk is used frequently in candies and desserts. Two, uh, two pounds of extra sugar is added for every 10 pounds of condensed milk. The Amish use both of these products a lot because they're inexpensive and they're convenient. Incidentally, I better check the ice cream again. It's doing very, very well. And I'll probably turn this from time to time. I don't want to goof up on this ice cream at this point. <laughs> to finish up this fabulous recipe, we're going to make a knock your socks off chocolate sauce. Americans absolutely love chocolate and we eat a staggering 9.4 pounds per person per year. Unfortunately, I probably fall into that statistic. In the double boiler, top, we have melted four squares of bitter chocolate and a half a cup of margarine. You could use butter, but this is rich enough, you really don't need to <laughs> use margarine on this. And we're going to then 
add alternately one pan of evaporated milk or condensed milk, as I discussed, and a pound of confectioner sugar. One time on the set, I desperately needed this instrument, and I called out and said, I need a church key, I need a church key, and nobody and the crew knew what I meant. They did not grow up with church keys. They grew up with pop cans that had flip tops. So here we're going to do this alternately. And now I'll add a bit of this milk. Chocolate's made from cocoa beans. And America's affection for it can be really traced to Milton Hershey and his very clever development of an inexpensive way to uh, mass produce it in the late 19th century. Because to you, Milton, you were a clever guy. And the rest of this. I've discovered through the years that I'm a noisy cook. I think I equate that perhaps with progress. And then we're going to add a teaspoon of vanilla have support with a teaspoon of salt. That salt takes away the terrible flatness that you might get. Now I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to really finish this up properly. But I want to tell you how to do it, because this is a fantastic fudge sauce. What you do next is cook this for 30 minutes over simmering water, and then transfer it immediately to your mixer bowl and beat it for five minutes. Do not, by all means, skip that beating thing or you're going to have a goofed up chocolate sauce. Now let's dish up the ice cream and hardly wait. <gasps> Quite perfect. Quite perfect. Mmm, don't you envy us? Don't you envy us? Notice this pretty doily on this plate. This was my grandmother's doilies, and I'm using a lot of her old linens because they really sort of enhance uh, service, I think. Ooh, perfect. This is, oh, I love it already. See, just a lovely texture. And everybody hovers around and wants to lick the, the paddles. And then to this, we're going to add some chocolate sauce that we had done up ahead of time. Having this on hand in the refrigerator is a very reassuring thing because you can almost entertain elegantly at the last minute, even using boughten ice cream. Is the word boughten correct? I think we'd say commercial ice cream. And then we're going to garnish it with a flower and one of my favorite leaves. This is apple geranium. This is really a choice dessert. Homemade ice cream and chocolate. Put sauce on top. You know, I agree with Mae West. Too much of a good thing can be wonderful. Let's review what we made today. We started with rice pudding, this lovely, appealing pudding that comes out of a long European tradition. The very unusual custard cornbread with its touch of buttermilk. And finally, the smooth and creamy custard pie. I'm going to show you today is a hole in the barn door variation but first I think I'd better put on these white gloves because I don't want to get sticky chocolate sauce on this gorgeous quilt. Uh, this is also sometimes called the monkey wrench pattern. This one was made by Mrs. Menno Yoder in 1935. That's certainly an Amish name, Mrs. Menno Yoder, isn't it? Mrs. Yoder made one of these black and yellow quilts for each of her 11 children. Can you imagine how much time that took? I did especially want to show you this quilt today because of its name, Hole in the Barn Door, exemplifies how the Amish quilters evolved the patterns from the things that they observed in their closed communities. For instance, consider the Amish quilt pattern monkey wrench or beans and corn are the most well-known of all, sunshine and shadow. This fabric of black sateen is rather unusual for an Indiana quilt. The quilter has bought the fabric special instead of piecing it from fabric she had on hand. It was much more common for Ohio quilters to use this black sateen than Indiana quilters. Also, this yellow background reminded me a great deal of our subject matter today, milk and butter. Since the back has been quilted with black thread, the back of this buttery yellow quilt has added distinction. So, until the next time, as a good or eat good.
And you know what? I'm going to go over and have some of that ice cream. All recipes seen in this series are available in Marsha Adams' book, Cooking from Quilt Country. This hardcover contains nearly 200 Amish and Mennonite recipes with color photographs and descriptions of the food and folkways of America's heartland. The cost of the book is $24.95 plus handling. Please have your credit card ready when you call 1-800-325-2667. Series 2 of Amish Cooking from Quilt Country is available on home video for $59.95 plus shipping. All 13 programs in this second series are compiled on three VHS cassettes. Call 1-800-325-2667 for credit card orders. Funding for Amish cooking from Quilt Country was provided by Merrillat Industries, America's cabinet maker.